Alleged ties between Wuhan's virology lab and the Chinese military. Documents from a state-funded project seemingly reveal evidence of their collaboration. A new plagiarism scandal strikes in China. An automaker there is found to have copied car designs from Western vehicles. Another big company finds itself in Beijing's crosshairs. The communist regime is launching a new antitrust investigation into an online food delivery giant. That's after targeting e-commerce giant Alibaba. A wind farm project near a U.S. Air Force base at the southern border is in the spotlight. It's owned by a former officer from China's military, but a new bill in Texas is putting a stop to foreign nationals getting quite so close to American military centers. And a Hong Kong immigrant tells her story of harassment from communist China. Since fleeing to Canada, she's faced continuous phishing calls and email scams, all working to track her down. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. The Wuhan Institute of Virology, or WIV, has allegedly worked with the Chinese regime's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, on a massive project investigating animal viruses, including bat viruses. Documents from China's National Natural Science Foundation show the state-led project first began in 2012. UK-based newspaper The Daily Mail first obtained the documents on Sunday. The project was set to discover new viruses that could infect humans and was set to investigate their evolution. The project has five team leaders, including Xi Zhenli. She is also widely known as Batwoman for her field of study. Another team leader is a senior PLA officer and expert on bioterrorism, Cao Wuchun. He is also the director of the Military Biosafety Expert Committee. Professor Xi denied her tie to the PLA last month, saying, I don't know of any military work at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But the U.S. State Department fact sheet from January claims there is secret military activity at the Wuhan lab. Cao Wuchun's presence as a military expert on the team leader's list is also suspicious. He is listed on project reports as a researcher, working closely with other military scientists. And he also sits on the WIV's advisory board, according to the Daily Mail. Tsai was also the second in command of the military team sent to take over the Wuhan lab during the initial stages of the outbreak last year. China's National Natural Science Foundation said in 2018 that the virus research project achieved significant progress. They are the state body that funded the project. And another team leader, Zhang Yongzhen, was the first to announce the genetic sequence of COVID-19 last January. During the first three years of the project, he took the team to many provinces in China to collect animal samples. He found 143 new viruses during this time. The massive sample collection, according to the Daily Mail, allowed Professor Xi to discover a strain named Rati G13. It's the closest known strain to the one causing the CCP virus pandemic. A new plagiarism scandal is making headlines in China. A Chinese automaker is allegedly copying the designs of Western vehicles. Multiple new models on display at the Shanghai Auto Show look almost identical to pre-existing European models. And Chinese carmaker Great Wall's three models are raising some eyebrows. Great Wall's electric car Punk Cat is believed to be based on the iconic Volkswagen Beetle. U.S. website CarScoop says Volkswagen is considering taking legal actions against the Chinese carmaker. The German company has stopped making the Beetle model since 2019, but it still owns the design rights. Volkswagen's new trademark e-Beetle suggests the legendary bug might make a comeback as an electric car. The Volkswagen Beetle isn't the only Western car model being replicated. Porsche and Rolls-Royce are in similar circumstances. Let's compare Rolls-Royce's SUV with Great Wall's Tank 800, plus Porsche sedan with Great Wall's Lightning Cat. Great Wall isn't the first Chinese company that is drawing scrutiny. Over the years, consumers have seen Chinese clones of many Western vehicles including the Mercedes-Benz G-Class 4x4 versus Chinese-made BJ80C, Porsche's Macan versus Chinese-made Zoti SR9, Rolls-Royce's Phantom versus China's Geely GE Limo, and Range Rover's SUV versus China's Landwin X7, among others. Big banks in Shanghai are promoting China's digital currency ahead of a May 5th shopping festival. It's seen as the government-approved alternative to Alipay and WeChat Pay that currently dominate the domestic market. 
China's big state banks in Shanghai are quietly promoting the digital yuan ahead of a May 5th shopping festival. The digital currency is a political mandate to provide consumers with payment alternatives to Alipay and WeChat Pay. China's financial hub Shanghai will pilot the currency, and state banks are persuading merchants and retail clients to download digital wallets to enable digital yuan payments. China is further ahead than other major economies in introducing a digital currency. Beijing regulators recently reined in Alipay's owner Jack Ma. They blocked a $37 billion IPO by Ma's company Ant Group last year and recently gave Alibaba a $2.8 billion antitrust penalty. The public line is to promote the digital currency as a backup method to existing payment channels. But in private, State banks are bluntly illustrating Beijing's intention to undercut Alipay and WeChat Pay's dominance. The Chinese regime in Beijing issues the digital currency. Unlike the decentralized Bitcoin, China's digital currency brings the regime more financial control. On one hand, the regime can trace tax frauds more easily. But on the other hand, it can also suppress dissidents more easily by controlling their wallets. Chinese financial services giant Ant Group's value could drop to as low as one-tenth of its value from last year. This, according to a Bloomberg intelligence analyst. Ant Group is backed by China's most prominent e-commerce company, Alibaba. Last November, Ant Group was valued at over $300 billion before Beijing forced it to suspend its initial public offering, or IPO, on the stock market. Bloomberg analyst Francis Chan says the company's valuation could plummet to a range of $29 to $115 billion. That would be one-tenth to one-half of the valuation from last November. This is because the company is restructured to a financial company, and Beijing is regulating it more like a bank. The Chinese regime has already dealt a couple heavy blows to Alibaba since last November. And Chinese regulators fined Alibaba a record $2.7 billion earlier this month. Alibaba has long been on a collision course with Chinese authorities. That's after Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma, blasted Chinese regulators at a forum in Shanghai last October. Beijing is tightening its grip on China's digital economy. The communist regime is launching an antitrust investigation into an online food delivery giant. That's after targeting e-commerce giant Alibaba. The food delivery firm is called Meituan. Authorities have accused the company of monopolistic behavior. China's state administration for market regulation is looking into a policy that forces other merchants to sell their goods exclusively on Meituan's platform. But this is actually a common practice in China. A lawyer from a Beijing-based law firm says there might be an ulterior motive for the investigation. He says it's to prevent these platforms from using their dominant position to exert influence over the regime or its judicial process. Meituan is a major player in China's food delivery market, while its other businesses include bike sharing services and restaurant reviews. A Chinese state-run media outlet is publicizing a poverty scandal in Sanxi province. It's an unusual move and seems to contradict Chinese authorities' current narrative. That's after the Communist Party's leader made a recent announcement about lifting Chinese citizens out of poverty. Just two months ago, CCP head Xi Jinping announced that residents in over 800 impoverished counties across China had been lifted out of poverty. Beijing praised it as a miracle under Xi's leadership. But people across China have told us their circumstances haven't actually changed. And for some, the situation is getting even worse because of the pandemic. Now, one of the Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpieces is saying the same. On April 24th, China Central Television, or CCTV, reported that many people in Luonan County in the northwestern province of Sanxi still live in poverty. That's the same province where Xi Jinping's family is from. The report even called Beijing's announcement poverty alleviation fraud. Local authorities immediately responded, calling it fake news. The province declared it had achieved full poverty alleviation back in February last year. According to CCTV's report, local authorities relocated the county's poor citizens to a settlement site before higher authorities came for an inspection. The move aimed to show the inspection team that the area's poverty-ridden people were being cared for, or at least make it appear that way.
The local authorities refused to respond to CCTV's request for comment. They even snatched the reporter's cell phone. On Monday, authorities in the province made an official announcement. They repeatedly stated that all citizens in the country were free from poverty. The incident sparked public debate and related topics started to trend online. In response, one citizen wrote, Can you believe the result released by Senchi's provincial authorities? Senchi's local government acts as both an athlete and a referee. How can they check themselves for problems? U.S.-based China Affairs commentator Xing Tianxing says this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the Chinese regime's fraud. She points out that China's so-called poverty alleviation effort is actually a political campaign. Discrepancies between Beijing's narrative and state-run media reports are extremely rare. Another China Affairs commentator named Gu Feng shed some light on what might have happened. Gu calls the poverty alleviation project Xi Jinping's crowning achievement and explains that CCTV's fraud report is obviously a slap in his face. Gu suggested that it's highly likely the report was arranged by anti-Xi Jinping forces within the party, aimed at deliberately hurting his reputation. Hong Kong authorities may soon have unlimited powers to stop anyone from leaving the region once they enter. Authorities are currently considering a new immigration bill. They could pass it as soon as Wednesday, and the bill could go into effect in August. Hong Kong authorities say the purpose of the bill is to screen illegal immigrants. They claim that they will not restrict movement based on race or ethnicity, political opinions, religion or philosophical beliefs. But there is no specific wording in the bill to limit their power. It could mean that authorities can bar anyone from leaving or entering the region without a court order. Lawyers and rights activists have accused Hong Kong authorities of mirroring Beijing's authoritarian style of exit bans. The bill comes amid Beijing's ongoing crackdown on Hong Kong's autonomy. Since the CCP passed the Hong Kong National Security Law, the Communist Party has continuously pushed the city down an authoritarian path. Coming up, a wind farm project near a U.S. Air Force base at the southern border is in the spotlight. It's owned by a former officer from China's military. But a new bill in Texas is putting a stop to foreign nationals getting quite so close to American military centers. More on that after the break. Hostile foreign regimes will now have to think twice before messing with Texas. A bill just passed the state Senate with flying colors that bans them from its critical infrastructure. One of the bill's main authors explained why it's so important. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. It prohibits countries that are hostile to our nation, specifically China, Russia, Iran and North Korea, from tying into our critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure such as our communications, cybersecurity, our electric grid, hazardous waste, and our water supply system. Texas State Senator Donna Campbell gives the example of a proposed wind farm project near an Air Force base in the southern border. The Chinese owner behind this investment is a former officer from the Chinese regime's military. His company bought 130,000 acres of land in western Texas beginning in 2015. What? is a Chinese citizen who's a billionaire, what is his interest whenever he's a high-ranking member of the, communist, the Chinese Communist Party, what's his interest in this project? It, as we looked into it, it started looking more and more like a Trojan horse. The investment drew scrutiny last year, with many experts believing it poses a national security threat. This is because the Chinese company might be able to collect intelligence from the military base, and the wind farm will be connected to the Texas electric grid. 
Texas State Representative Tan Parker highlights Texas's strategic importance to the nation. Texas is home to 15 military installations and over 227,000 uniformed and Department of Defense civilian personnel. Texas hosts an array of combat capable military units and innovative military installations on the forefront of cutting edge technology. The new bill will prohibit businesses from signing any contracts with Chinese, Russian, Iranian and North Korean based companies or companies owned by citizens of the four countries in relation to infrastructure. It has now moved to the Texas State House. Allison Lee, NTD News. The UK is sanctioning 22 people, including 14 Russians, involved in serious corruption. It's the first time the UK used its new anti-corruption powers. Some British lawmakers are asking if they can also punish Chinese officials in the same way. NTD's Jane Wirrell has more. The UK Foreign Secretary confirming to Parliament on Monday new sanctions targeting international corruption. These people have caused untold damage, untold hardship on the countries and the communities which they exploited for their own predatory greed. So today we send a clear message. Those sanctioned today are not welcome in the UK. They will not be able to use British bank accounts or businesses to give their illicit actions some veneer of respectability because their assets will be frozen. And I can tell the House that more designations will follow in due course based on the policy note as well as the like legal criteria that we've set out and assessed against the evidence. People hit by the UK's asset freezes and travel bans include 14 Russian nationals who are involved in a corruption scheme worth £165 million, as well as three South Africans, a Sudanese businessman and three individuals accused of supporting a huge drugs trafficking cartel. One of those was also sanctioned by the US on the same day. Some called on the Foreign Secretary to widen the designations to target corrupt people in different countries. Human rights in China is in the forefront of some MPs' minds, with the Commons passing a motion last week declaring China is committing genocide against Uyghurs. All these sanctions, new sanctions, apply equally to all individuals that fall fall short of the law. Um, for example, will they apply not to junior but senior officials in the Chinese Communist Party who are implicitly involved in the abuse of the Uyghur and are living off the finances of Uyghur slave labour? He confirmed he will look into it. The challenge, of course, is that higher up the chain you go, the, the more indirect, I think, was uh, her, in her words, um, uh, the, the, the links are, and the challenge is to make sure we've got the evidence. But we will look at this uh, based on the seriousness of the, uh, the activity. Rob's US counterpart welcomed the UK's new anti-corruption sanctions. Jane Warrell, NTD News, London. Harassment calls and phishing emails have become a constant part of one Chinese woman's life. They began after she immigrated to Canada in 1989. Hers is one of many cases where Chinese communist agents seem to keep a close eye on dissidents, even outside China. NTD's Xu Wenhui has more. The chairperson of a pro-democracy organization is speaking out against long-term harassment from the Chinese Communist Party. Gloria Fung is the chairperson of Canada Hong Kong Link, a Canada-based nonprofit organization working to secure public support for democracy in Hong Kong. Fung immigrated to Canada from China in 1989 and has been receiving harassment calls since. Before leaving China, she witnessed the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. That's when Chinese troops opened fire on unarmed student protesters in Beijing. They had gathered to ask for democracy and better access to education. After watching the event play out, Feng began publicly voicing criticism toward the communist regime. She told NTD that the Chinese regime's infiltration and interference in Canada has been constant. She also explained that as an organizer of a pro-democracy group, she inevitably became a target. She says she receives calls from all over China, and the callers speak in different dialects and accents. They say you're already in Canada. Why bother getting involved in China and Hong Kong business? If you continue doing this, you'll have to watch out for your own safety. Similar threats also come through the Internet. She says warnings and alerts often pop up while using her computer. IT experts blame the attacks on state-backed hackers trying to access her data. Luckily, they have not been successful. The digital attacks come through emails, too. 
Fung says she regularly gets phishing emails on sensitive days, like the anniversary of the Tiananmen massacre, often with attachments attempting to hack into her computer. These are also a kind of Chinese phishing operation. Once the attachment is opened, it can immediately hack into my computer and steal confidential information. And the Chinese regime also uses these methods, too, in their efforts to locate her. Feng says after speaking at an international media event in 2019, she received an email asking for her help. The email sender pretended to be a newcomer to Hong Kong from mainland China. The person asked for her help and her address. Recognizing the trick, Fung instead asked for the person's phone number, but they suddenly stopped responding. And a week later, she got another round of similar emails. Actually, I know these are mostly tricks from the National Security Department. Maybe they want to kidnap me, but don't know where I am. If I told them, I probably would have disappeared in Hong Kong. Fung says these life-threatening situations are common for pro-democracy organizers, adding that they always treat them with caution. She likens Hong Kong to a textbook for the world. She explains that everything Hong Kong has faced will likely happen in Taiwan and in every other corner of the international community. Fung is urging cooperation across the globe to stop it. Xu Wenhui, NTD News. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter. We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you.